Thank you for joining us on our journey here to preserve the history of mixed martial arts. When I wanted to take on this project, I needed help. I brought in one of my favorite matchmakers, Miguel Iterate, and the MMA detective, Mike Davis. So to do this, we've been able to preserve history. Welcome and enjoy. Welcome to the Lights Out Podcast. I am Mike Davis. Along with me, as always, Chris Lytle. Joining us, the People's Warrior, Josh Berkman. Welcome, brother. Thanks, yeah. Thanks for having me, man. I haven't done one of these in a while, so it'll be fun to reminisce and talk fight stories with you guys. Now, now the good thing is we like to go to the very beginning, uh, start about how your career started. And those are usually kind of the funner stories a lot of times because it was madness right. back in the day. So we're going to go back to the beginning. Mike, what do, you, what do you got from the beginning? Well, here's the thing with him. Let's get the plugs out of the way. Josh, what, what are you working on right now? So, I mean, now, I mean, fighting so far in my river mirror, I've been retired for four years. Um, I have no desire in me to fight or compete. Um, I feel like my ego was fully served, you know, and now I'm just a husband and I'm a father. You know, I have two little boys. I have a, a baby girl that's eight months old and I'm really a family man, you know, and then um but I'm still very immersed in martial arts. Uh, we have a gym, it's called the Dojo. Um, it's very focused on like uh, kids learning MMA, yoga, meditation, all, all the disciplines that go into movement. Um, and then I run a, a wrestling club, it's called the Olympus Wrestling Club. And every year that's getting bigger and bigger, our gym's growing. And then, you know, I, besides that, I watch my kids play football, watch them wrestle, hang out with my wife. And like I said, I'm very much a family man, which is so much different from that UFC fighter, you know, that I was in my 20s, you know, and things like that. Josh, that was uh, part of the hard part for me when I was fighting. I had four kids, you know, so I was trying to balance that and do that and still work full time at the fire department. And, and, you know, I think a lot of people think I quit early, you right. know, but, uh, yeah, I just had to, man. I was I was neglecting some family time, and I was like, man, you're not getting this back. And it just uh, – I think you've probably done things a little bit of a smarter route. You're doing that now, and I was doing that. It just – there was no time for anything, man. My life was chaotic for about 20 years. Yeah, I remember that. You know, I remember actually, like, you know, I, you were one of the fighters I really liked to watch fight, you know. Thank you. Also, the fact that I was like, how are these guys doing the fire department – and the kids and the, you know what I mean? Because I, you know, during that time, you know, in my twenties, I was single and, and being a professional fighter was enough for me, you know, but being a UFC fighter was never my like main goal in life. My main goal in life was always to have a home and a family and a career that I loved. And, you know, it's like, you know, the UFC was so amazing, but everything set me up to be where I'm at now. And now I really feel like I'm living the dream, you know? That's uh, that's, that's beautiful because a lot of people, they can't ever get past that. Uh, and, and I feel bad for them because I'm like, man, you peaked out at 30 or something, you know what I mean? Like, what's the rest right. of your life about? Now you just, you know, you're always reminiscing back. And, and don't get me wrong, I love my UFC days. But like you said, that was a part of the development of where I'm at now, you know, I still got goals now. It, I'm not looking in the rearview mirror. That's cool what it was, but I'm always looking forward. I got more things I want to do, and, and I'm happy what I'm doing now. So I'm glad you have that. A lot of people don't. It's weird. No. So how old were you when you uh, stopped fighting, Chris? Well, when I, I retired from the UFC, I was like 37. But, I mean, I, I came out of retirement did three bare knuckle fights, but that was just for fun. After, I mean, I watched. Right. It's like, I got to do this a couple of times because, it looked fun. You know, it wasn't about a real career. It was just, I got to do this, man. It, it, it's something right. different. Now I do the commentary for it, so it worked out. And I feel like I, I, that's what, I think I was done at the UFC at 37, too. And then I came sure. back and did a grappling match and did one more fight. And I was like, it was, it was different. You know, I didn't have that drive to go out and, you know, destroy dudes or train yeah. the same way. You know, my, and that's why I say, you know, my ego had been served. But the reason it got served is because... I fought professionally for 17 years. I had 27 pro fight. I think the record of like the guys that I fought was, you know, 1300 and 400, you know, like yeah. I fought <laughs> really good guys. I never took easy fights. You know, I fought injured. I fought, um, you know, I never really backed out of a fight. And so I think by the time that I was done, I was just done, 
my ego has been served. I didn't need to prove that I was the baddest dude in the world anymore, you know, which was like that driving force behind that 23 year old kid that was like, I'm gonna make it to the UFC. <laughs> well, you don't get close to the 50 Fight Club. Like, if you're either a 50 Fight Club member or close to it, you can't say no often. You can't. It's not possible. 100%. Your entire career, not just one or two. For sure. You know, that yeah. goes back to like when, when we were talking about the beginning, right? You know, you know, I was I was a 22 year old kid who was playing college football and college baseball and really? never any MMA experience. I had never done jujitsu. I had never done boxing. I was a I was a football player and I was playing at a school called Dixie State. And I but I had been in 100 plus street fights, you know, like <laughs> I was known for fighting well before I was ever in the UFC in Utah because our high school baseball team got suspended for brawls. You know, wow. we were fighting all the time after basketball games. And there was in Utah, there was this like underground fight community, right? Like everybody knew who the toughest guy at the other schools were. And after games, they would meet in the parking lot and be like, that's our baddest dude. That's our baddest dude. And you would see who was the baddest dude. And I never fantastic. lost, you know? That's and, fantastic. And, so and, you and that's how I grew up fighting. That was my amateur career, you know? <laughs> you were playing college football. What position did you play there? So I was playing tailback um, at Dixie. And my my sophomore year, wow. I got All-American. I had 1,500 yards rushing. I scored 15 touchdowns. Wow. Um, and a lot of the games, I had 150 yards by halftime. We were up by 40 points, and I didn't even get to play in the second half. Man, how much, how much did you weigh back then? I was 205. So I would get into the offseason about 205. I would play right around 202, you know, and I looked like a football player. Big shoulders. I wore a size 36. You know, I ran a four five. You know, I would I was, I think at Dixie, we had eight uh eight running backs, six of them were black, two of us were white, you know, and and everybody would always be like, you know, and that's what I had to like figure out right is like how to be that that guy in that room and football I always thought I would be a professional football play, uh, player I thought I would play on Sundays that was always my life dream mm -hmm. I didn't have a dream of fighting in the UFC and then I had a full ride scholarship to go to the University of Utah so I, oh, I got wow. a scholarship and they they uh McBride who was the coach at the time left the University of Utah and they brought in Urban Meyer oh. and Urban Meyer said we'll still give um, our junior college recruits their scholarships. But the guy that recruited me ended up going to Southern Utah and they, the University of Utah still wanted me to come up there. And um, so I was moving from Southern Utah up to back up to Salt Lake. And I heard this thing on the radio and it said, we're having NHB fights in downtown Salt Lake City. If you think you're the baddest dude in Utah, call us and come find out. And it was called the ultimate combat experience. So like prior to that though. Yeah. You weren't you a state champion wrestler? Yeah. So I, I did wrestle in high school. I, uh, so I wrestled in junior high and high school and yeah, going way back to that. Right. Like I had an older brother that was just tough and rough. And he's probably the reason that I was as tough as I was. Right. And a junior high coach, when I was 12 years old, came up to me and said, you ever want to beat up your brother, you better wrestle. And I looked at him. <laughs> Smart and man. I, and I was playing basketball, you know. And I was like, okay, like, I'll come out and try out wrestling. You know, and he's like, well, you can't wrestle and play basketball. And I was like, well, I'm a basketball player. You know, a 5'9 white kid, right? And, uh, <laughs> and, and, and basketball was one of my favorite sports. You know, I played basketball, football, I wrestled. And I played baseball too in high school. And so um, he told me that if I didn't stop playing basketball, I wouldn't be able to wrestle on the team. So I started going to the tournaments in basketball shorts and wasn't a part of the junior high wrestling team. I was independent and started winning the wrestling tournaments. Wow. And so the wrestling coach was like, hey, listen, I want you to sign up and be part of our team now. So what <laughs> they do is let me go to basketball practice and then after basketball practice, I go into the last 45 minutes of wrestling practice. And I just really, really learned to love wrestling. 
so then I won, you know, regionals district when I was in eighth grade, when I was in ninth grade, um, I didn't lose a match in ninth grade and I was just a little novice wrestler, you know, like, and, but wrestling never really, I never thought you could go anywhere with it. You know, I think the only place I thought that was the coolest thing in the world was the WWF at the time. <laughs> I wanted to be the ultimate warrior. I thought Hulk Hogan was the coolest. And, and, you know, like when I showed up at wrestling, when I was 12, I thought I was going to be able to body slam people, you know? And so then when I got to high school, um, I, I, I played on the um, high school baseball team when I was in ninth grade. And after one of my practices, a guy named Ben Ojai came out to my practice. Ben Ojai wrestled at uh, BYU. He was, uh, you know, wrestled with the Olympics, wrestled with the Schultz brothers. Jeez. Um, he's a he's an incredible um, wrestler and man, right? And he came up to me and he said, he, he, he goes, Berkman, come here. And my brother had told me about this guy, Ben Ojai, the wrestling coach, you know, that he was like the coolest teacher. And uh, he says, come over here and talk to me for a minute. So I, you know, I was, we were doing batting practice. I walked over and he goes, are you going to wrestle or play basketball? Again, I'm in ninth grade. I'm not even in high school yet. And I said, I'm going to play both. And he's like, there's no way that you're going to be <laughs> both in high school. And I'm like, that's what they told me in junior high too. And he goes, they're not. He's like, but I want you to wrestle for me. He's like, I heard you like to fight. And I was like, yeah, I'm not scared of a fight. And he's like, come to my room. Your brother knows where my room's at. Just have your brother Brent come to my room. And I want to show you a video um, before we start school next year. And I was like, cool, I'll come to your room. So I went into the room and this is 1990 five maybe 1994 right and i go in his room and he pops in this vhs and he says watch this and it's matt hughes wrestling at iowa and then it goes from matt hughes wrestling at iowa to some mma fights and i don't remember if they were ufc or whatever but it was matt hughes fighting you know and i looked at him and i said i'll be at wrestling and that's <laughs> like that shift for me of you know Again, I'm a five nine white kid. Like I don't know how far basketball is going to go for me, but I'm always going to be fighting. You know, like that's just a personality type. You know, and um, then I started. You know, I wrestled in high school, and uh, really, you know, after high school, I had some offers to go wrestle, but I told my coach, you know, I wasn't interested in wrestling at all in college. I was interested in baseball and football. So yep. okay, that's kind of like the wrestling the career and really that wrestling background is what helped me win my first 10 MMA fights, you know. Well, let's start with the first one. It's February 7, 2003, Ultimate Combat Experience. Right. Hank Weiss is 4-0, and and he's actually a heavyweight. Right, right. So this is when I was on my way home from Dixie and moving back up to Salt Lake, right? And I heard that, um, the, the, basically the advertisement on the radio, if you think you're the baddest dude in Utah, come sign up. And I needed some money. I needed to make money. I was, we didn't have no NIL or anything like that going on. Right. We were like broke football players. And so um, the winner of the matches each got a hundred bucks. And then if you won the finale, you got 500 bucks. And I was just like, I'm going to, I'm going to beat these dudes up. So that was a Thursday. I called up that number. So right after I listened to the interview, my buddy, Charlie Johnson called me about three minutes later. And he goes, bro, you'll never guess what I just heard on the radio. And I was like, was it the ultimate combat experience? He's like, yeah. I'm like, I heard the same thing. And he's like, I wrote the number down for you. You should call it. And I was like, cool. Give me the number. So then I, uh, I ended up calling the number. I go, Hey, what's up? This is Josh Berkman. I heard the, um, uh, thing on the radio about the fights and they're like, where do you train at? And I was like, well, I don't really train. I'm a football player. And uh, they're like, do you have any experience? I'm like, yeah, I wrestled in college. I'm in shape, though. And they're like, what do you mean you're in shape? I'm like, oh, well, I'm training for football and stuff. I'll be all right. And they said, well, we don't have anybody for you to fight um, right now. The only guy we have is the guy, his name's Hank Weiss. He's undefeated. And he won the last tournament. So they've done one tournament before this. This was the second, like, tournament they were having. Let me, a little background on Hank Weiss. Pedro Sauer guy. He right, goes right. by the vice, very strong. He was very ahead of his time in regards to training. <laughs> for sure. For sure. 
And then that he showed me that our first fight. <laughs> and so they go, Hey, this guy's trained in martial arts. He won the first one. Um, so unless you want to fight him, you're going to have to wait. And I was like, what does he weigh? They're like, he's right around 200 pounds. I was like, perfect. I'll fight him. And they're like, really? Uh, yeah, I'll fight this. I'll fight this dude. And they're like, cool. That was a Thursday. I showed up on Friday and weighed in and I fought this dude, Hank Weiss on a Saturday. And my mom was like, I can't believe you're doing this. I won't, <laughs> I won't support this. My dad said the same thing. My dad's, you know, I grew up in fight, fighting in bars. I'm not going to support this. I'm like, no, it's a sport. This is like, it's a sport and it's in a ring. And then my dad's like, I'm not coming. Of which home. you've got no training for. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm no training. Yeah, so, you wrestled. Yeah, that's what I said. I wrestled. Plus I had a hundred plus fist fights. Like I was going to be fine. Never got a black guy. Never got hurt. Like I, I knew how to fight. I thought. And uh, until I got in there with Hank Weiss. So that first fight, I was like, I'm going to smash this dude. You know, like he didn't look like much of anything. Right. And now we know better that that it's not necessarily the looks that makes the fighter. Right. And uh, I went out and I beat this dude up for two and a half minutes. And he just kept grabbing me and holding me and I'd try to throw him off me and I picked him up and slammed him a couple times on his head and he'd be trying to grab my neck. So at the end of the three minutes, I got up, I went back, sat in the corner. My cousin was in my corner and I just, I couldn't move for like 30 seconds. I just was sitting in the corner with my head down, wondering what the hell I just got myself into. Cause none of my fights had ever lasted three minutes, you know, no street fight does. No, 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 they were quick. They were broke up. They were whatever they were. Right. And this guy kept tying me up and making me tired. And my cousin looks up at me and goes, you okay? And I was like, I, I can't move. And he goes, well, you better figure it out. Cause you got 15 seconds before you got to get up. And I look over at this dude, Hank at the other corner. And he's like, jumping bouncing. around, bouncing around. I'm like, Oh man. Okay. I just started. Yeah. I just started <laughs> right? for him. And I think that it was a three, three minute round. So then I, um, I went out, threw an overhand into a double leg, picked him up, slammed him. And somehow as we hit the ground, he had wrapped around my arm and locked my arm and hit an arm bar. And I was like, oh, my arm's about to break. And I tapped out and I laid there. And I laid there and all I could do was smile because I had never felt more alive in my whole life. Wow. It was just, I, I lost. Um, it was the hardest thing that I think I had ever done at that point, you know, is get up off that chair and go across and, and get back out and go throw again. And they raised his hand. I went back in the back. I dry heaped a little bit, laid on my back. And I just had this vision that this was what I was supposed to be doing. And I feel, and, and, and I, in this vision, I, I feel like I was like, this is going to be the biggest sport in the world. This is going to be a huge sport. This is going to save my life and I should do this. And, and I probably laid on my back exhausted for 20 minutes, you know, just so that, but leave me alone, get away from me, you know? And so then for about- Wait, 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 wait. did mom and dad go? Did they tell? No, no, they didn't go. They didn't come till after my third fight. So, so um, at, th at this point, you're not even like really watching any of the UFCs or anything, right? No, I mean, I think I watched the like the real early ones where the guy had the boxing glove and the early <laughs> Gracies and stuff. But I didn't, I, I wasn't paying attention to what was happening with the UFC or anything like during this this time, you know. What what year was this that you're talking about here? So this was like 2002, 2003 time. Oh, okay. it was 2002, okay. I think maybe when I fought Hank. Um, no, you fought him 2003. 2003. February 2003. Okay. So when do you hook in with like Garrett Barlow in the Global Combat? I think it later Slam Inc. Because I know that was your first right. gym. Yeah. So what, what ended up happening was I called up the University of Utah a week later after that fight and said, hey, I'm dropping out of school. I'm giving up my scholarship. You guys can give it to somebody else. And the athletic director was like, huh? Like, <laughs> These guys are excited about you coming in. Wow. There's one kid in front of you, possibly. 
Um, and not to mention Utah went 11 and 0 that year. Alex oh. Smith was their quarterback. They played in the Fiesta Bowl, beat Alabama, something like that, right? Like they were undefeated that first year of Urban Meyer. So part of me watching that season, you know, was was really hard on me because I was like, and the running back that was going to be ahead of me was a kid named White, and he got hurt. So they had this Ooh. average running back back there too, you know. So that was that was that was really tough on me. And I actually stopped watching football for about four or five years. Um, and but what I did do is I started going to do jujitsu every day, sometimes twice a day, because this little punk Hank Weiss about ripped my arm off and I was coming back after him. So in, started, in Hank Weiss's corner, was Pedro Sauer there or Mark Schultz? No, not back then. And actually Schultz <laughs> showed up at my gym to help me pretty quick after that because him and Ben Ohi were best friends. And so oh, Ohi called wow. him and said, hey, Josh is getting into this MMA stuff. And Schultz had just like kicked some pain pills and things like that. And so he wanted to like come back out and, and help me out a little bit too. So Schultz wasn't around, but he did show back up a little bit after that um, to, to kind of give me some guidance and help me out. So yeah, you guys got a legendary area of talent. It's, really it's, good. it's pretty incredible, incredible, man. You know, yeah. like, uh, right. you know, Utah gets a little bit um, under the shadows, you know, but there's a lot, I mean, there's, Walt Bayless is out here. I mean, that guy was, he's, I got his artwork all over my gym. Me and him are great friends. We never talked much during my career, but we've become really close after I retired, which is interesting, you know? Yeah. Yeah. There's just so many, I mean, so many good guys out here. And I'm, I think it's the fingerprints that Pedro Sauer left. He, he didn't hold anything back from his students and everybody that absorbed his knowledge just Gave right back to the community. Pedro Sauer is a legend, man. Yeah, Absolute is, legend. Pedro Sauer and Walt Bayless, they're, like you said, you know, their fingerprint is pretty much on every gym in use, <laughs> you know, all of them. So the, uh, and, I, and I got to chain with Pedro for, you know, quite a while. So that was, that was before he moved away and stuff like that too. And he was actually my second jujitsu instructor, you know. Well, well, your first was Global Combat, correct? Was that your first gym? Well, my, my first, I trained at that gym, Ultimate Ultimate Combat Experience. And and that's where, and that's the guy that like, um, through the show, he let the fighters all come in and train there. And the guy that taught me jujitsu was a guy named Mike, and he was a black belt underneath Pedro Sauer. So Man, Mike, Mike Stidham? Not, Mike Stidham owned the gym. And okay. the guy that taught me jujitsu was an attorney. It was a tall, real lean guy. His name was Mike something. I forget. And he was nasty. And I was like, man, if these dudes can do this, like, I'm just going to absorb all this information and I'm going to beat everybody, you know? And so that's what I did. So I fought. So what I, I, I trained at Mike Stidham's gym for a while, but then I had How this. How is he as a person? Because he's kind of a controversial figure. Mike Stidham, you know, he's, he's kind of like a Dana White on a small level. You know what I mean? Like some people like him, some people don't like him. Um, personally, like he's done a lot of things that were beneficial for me, but he's not a good, he's not a great person. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you know, he's- Well, he, he was cutting interviews on you for a while. I remember those. Yeah, for sure. You know, and and again, he, he liked me, but he didn't really like me. You know what I mean? He liked me because I was good for the show, um, you know, but he also- um, he didn't want anybody being bigger than his show, you know, and that happened pretty quick, but he benefit, he, uh, again, I would have never, um, I would have never lived the life that I lived. And I'm so grateful for the life that I lived. And I wouldn't have had that if it wasn't for Mike Stidham, because cool. there wouldn't have been a show There wouldn't have been a platform. And I don't want to be a promoter. I don't want to deal with fighters. I barely want to train fighters. So I understand that some of these promoters get sick of fighters. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, but what I am is I always see, you know, the positives for the most part. And again, I wouldn't even have had an MMA career. I wouldn't have known about the sport. I wouldn't have had a platform to fight on all the time if it wasn't for Mike Stidham and what he created. So I'm always grateful for that, you know? A lot of people don't really understand that as far as, especially in boxing, but just in the fight world in general, if you don't have somebody putting on fights that's kind of benefiting you, I mean, you're, you're brought in as a B-side all the time to go into somebody's hometown. That's a tough way to make it. I mean, we've had guys on here right. like, 
I remember when I fought Matt Brown, I was like, who's this guy? His record is like 11 and six. He's terrible. And then I look at his record, I'm like he went in everybody's hometown and fought. I was like, this dude gave me all I could handle. It sucks. You know what I mean? But it's like, there's guys like that and you go the tough route. And like you said, this Mike guy was doing you a service. He might not even like you, but you benefited. It's like that give and take relationship. You guys both benefited each other. So it worked out. hundred percent. Yeah. And that's why there's also, I mean, we had fight shows going on in Utah every weekend where guys were coming really? from Idaho, guys were coming, and it was on TV right away. So my very first fight was on TV. Wow. Um, and then, and, 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 and so like to kind of get into that, the Stidham put us on TV. He only paid us a hundred bucks, but I, instantly I started getting sponsors, right? Because during mm-hmm. that real estate was hot, everybody had money. And so then I, I jumped in the ring pretty quick after I lost to Hank. And then I rematched Hank in, I think, my third or fourth fight. Well, okay, well, here's the question that we like that's kind of puzzling. So April 5th is your second fight. Yeah, okay. But then you got April 12th, May 3rd, May 10th. Or because it's on TV, are these all filmed on the same day? Or are you guys, is he doing a weekly show? So the, the tournament was like a six-week tournament. So, <laughs> and there were like eight guys in it. So you'd fight every weekend. If if you won, if you lost, and I was winning, and I was winning in 30 seconds, a minute and 10 seconds. I beat Hank Weiss in three seconds. What? On our rematch. Three seconds, the first punch? We came out, I threw a leg kick, and he ran at me. And so we came out, I threw a leg kick, picked him up, slammed him on his back, and knocked him out cold, and it was three seconds flat. (laughs) And so (laughs) that might not be a record. I'll, I'll have to show you guys the, the, the video and it's on my Instagram, you know, it's, and it's like that it's quick, you know, it's faster than Masvidal. I think it's the quickest one. Maybe not, maybe not faster than that one. It's uh, close. Right. Wow. And so then what happened is I got a sponsorship. I had a guy come up to me and say, at a, at a, at, cause we fought in bars and we fought in clubs and, and, and we were partying a lot after the fights. Cause it was just kind of like what was happening. And I had this guy come up to me at the club and say, Hey, I watched your fight on TV last night and he's like, are you going to make it to the UFC? And I was like, I I don't even know that I, you know, and he's like, I want to help you. And I was like, you want to help me? I'm like, whatever. I don't want to talk business right now. And he's like, no, you want to talk business right now. He's I'm a businessman and I will teach you how to get sponsors and how to build a business. And this is usually a horrible, horrible life decision, but okay, go ahead. <laughs> the, the good stuff usually doesn't come from conversations like this. Right. Okay. So we left, the, <laughs> we left, we left the building and we went to his office and he goes, this is my office. This is what I do. He goes, I love fighting. I was a wrestler. He's like, I think you can be great and I will sponsor you for a year. He's like, I'll give you $10,000 right now. And I'll give you two thousand dollars a month for a year. And wow! You everything and train all day, every day. And he wrote me a check, and he gave me two thousand dollars a year for the next four years, or two thousand wow. dollars a month for the next four years. Man, you had a great setup. Usually, that ends with all of a sudden him saying, "But the problem is, you have to do everything naked, right. Right? or something weird." If you heard of OnlyFans? <laughs> this guy just—he ended up being one of my best friends, <laughs> especially now. You know. <laughs> And he ended up being one of my best friends, um, wow. and one of my greatest mentors. And so wow. he had a big area in the back of his building that had garage doors. And he said, if you want to build a gym, you can build a gym back there. And I said, uh, yeah. and this is later. This is a little later. So I went to my high school wrestling coach. And I said, hey, I need wrestling mats. My high school wrestling coach gave me wrestling mats. I went out and bought a bunch of bags. And I, because... In 2003 in Utah, there was no real MMA gyms. Guys did, there was a boxing gyms. There was some jujitsu gyms. Um, there was a couple places that were Muay Thai, but nobody did everything. And so I opened a gym and we started training for fights. And the more people that I beat, every time people would be like, hey, where do you train? I'd be like, I have my own gym. Come train with me. I have my own gym. Come train with me. So within that first year of fighting, I, I went out, I lost the first fight. I won my next nine fights in a row. Um, and we were all training at my gym in the back of this building. 
and somebody came in. And so I had all the guys training at my gym. Everybody was cool. And uh, that was kind of like the first year of my, of my MMA career, you know? So, and then so, so real quick, are, are you, are you basically the kind of like the head coach or is anybody coaching you guys that's teaching each other? Or is there anybody there with more experience? I mean, you have 10 fights at this point, but I mean, is it just, are right. you, are you teaching or who's teaching you? So I was running the class. I was teaching the class. So <laughs> what we would do is we would come in, we would, we would do our warm ups, and, um, and then we would like, you know, we, whether we were in big gloves that day or MMA gloves, and I would just kind of run the session. And every once in a while, somebody would come in and I'd be like, Hey, teach us something like, you know, yeah. a guy named Derek Downey or a guy named Brandon Melendez or, and so they would give us drills and, you know, the, and, but usually, so this is something not a lot of people know, but I dove into like all the Bruce Lee books. So everything Bruce Lee, man, I could get my hands on. I started to just study and train and, you know, it's one of the reasons I switched my stance early on. All the boxing coaches would be like, don't switch your stance. Stay in one stance. Joe Rogan early in my fights would be like, Burns been switching a lot. We don't see guys do this, you know? <laughs> and and it really, and then the other way that I learned is all the Boss Rutan videos. I would take all Boss Rutan's drills in from his videos and we would drill those videos. And then I read, a, I had a Gracie Jiu Jitsu book. And I had all Boss Rutan's books. And that was how I taught That's my- good foundation. That's good how I taught myself to fight. All right. Matt, you so, know, I, I, go ahead. Go ahead. I didn't, have about switching, I didn't have you talk a about coach. switching. You talk about switching stances. Yeah. Are you talking about, did you have the traditional wrestler stance where it's strong hand forward? Or were you in a traditional boxing stance where your strong hand is in the back? When I wrestled, I always switched my stances because my coach was like, you got- great technique both ways and we always drilled it both ways so i always would just switch my stance left forward right forward um and that kind of like moved into the mma where my dad always told us he'd make us throw left-handed and throw right-handed he'd make us bat left-handed and he'd make us bat right-handed and my dad would always say god gave you two hands for a reason learn to use them both and when I, first time i hit mitts with like a pro boxing coach He's like, what stance do you stand in? And I was like, both. And he's like, no, no, <laughs> you don't. And so, he's like, here, stand in your orthodox stance. Give me a hook. Switch your stance. Give me a hook. He goes, you got power in both hands. So you got, you got <laughs> yeah. real power in both I hands. Yeah. And, and the I one said, in a million. Yeah. That's, why I, switch, that's why I switched stances. And that was always a debate with like my boxing coaches and things like that. Um, I out. always just switch stance. And at the end of my career, I'm mostly in a left-handed stance, you know, because I liked, uh, I liked, you know, trying to get the outside and playing that game, you know, and then switching into my right-handed stance off my cross so that I could hit my double leg with my lead leg forward. So, you know, and now it's interesting, like I said, because you go back and look at the fights, nobody was doing it then, you know, and now so it, it, many guys are Now a lot of people do it. Right. Yeah. Back then, though, it was very rare. You know, you were right hand, left hand. That was it. And then right. and now I think people are learning. It, it does make sense to switch sometimes. It just give people different angles at times. Right. Um, yeah. Now, I'm, I'm a big believer in what you, the way you kind of grew into fighting. Like, I think the way – I think it was just an old school method was you didn't really – like, we didn't have real – instructors either it was kind of like the blind leading the dead like you just kind of taught each other how to fight and you came up with 100%. your own style which i think is good because if you go to a traditional place and they this is how you do it a b c you know you move the leg like this you put the arm bar it's very common everybody knows but when you do it it's for your style however josh berkman does it is going to be unique right. you knew you know what a jiu-jitsu guy is going to do before they do it they don't know what you're going to do so i always think developing your own style is more beneficial do you feel that as well yeah, I absolutely do. And again, that goes back to kind of like the Bruce Lee thing. You know, when I was studying Bruce Lee, you know, Bruce Lee, he said, it's all the art of fighting, whether you call it jujitsu, whether you call it boxing, whether you, whatever you call it, it's all the art of fighting. And you need to study all the arts because what works for somebody else isn't going to work for you, but study everybody and take what works and leave what doesn't. And that's can't what, argue what it. I did, you know? Yeah, you can't argue it. So, Chris, you know how sometimes when you get into the MMA scene, sometimes 
it takes a little while to before you feel like you belong there. I I don't think Josh, you ever felt like you didn't belong. In fact, you almost had a, almost like a right, like you you, you deserved it. Like, and and one of the examples I could take is on June fourteenth, two thousand three, Brian Gerlich fought your brother. He fought your brother, <laughs> right. uh, Jared. Yeah. Do you want to tell anybody what what took place there? So which fight was that? Because that was, I think Brian and Garlic was maybe my fourth or fifth fight or something. No, your brother's fight. Okay, so what happened? Well, my brother fought him. There's, we were in this tournament. And my brother decided that he was going to get in it and he was going to do it. And I was like, you bro, you're going you're gonna to smash dudes too. The difference <laughs> is my brother never had a wrestling background. Oh, yeah. Which is why I was able to start beating him up at 15. <laughs> the, re- the junior high wrestling coach was right. So... Uh, my brother fought this guy, Brian Garlic, and Brian was trained. Like he was trained in stand up. He trained in the military. He'd done jujitsu before and he beat my brother up pretty good. Um, and, and after the fight, I got in there and I said, well, now you got to fight me. I said, me and you are next. And, you know, the promoters grabbed me and pulled me back. And I was like, bro, I'm just promoting our next fight. I'm not really all that mad. I was a little heated. Right. And uh, my brother, you know, um, afterwards he had a concussion, his eyes were dilated. And I was like, I'm going to smash this dude for you. <laughs> it's the worst thing he could have done. And I told him that I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to destroy you. I'm going to end your career in the, in the cage, you know? And so then I ended up getting a re uh, getting a fight with Brian garlic in like the next round or somewhere down the road, you know, it was uh, three, three fights later. Yeah. Three fights later. And I went in, threw a couple punches, picked this dude up, slammed him, mounted him, and hit him in the face probably 20 times. And hit him with a few elbows in between those 20 times. And I... Uh, and I no, and I, commission. no, commission. no commission. No commission. No commission. You know? And, uh, <laughs> and they... Well, Utah was pretty good because they had this early success in these TV shows and stuff, you know? And, but... The, the referees sometimes let him go a little too long. And <laughs> that one was one of the cases. And then they pulled me off him. Man, I'll, I'll never forget Brian, Brian Garlic because he laid in the ring for 11 minutes while they, like, <laughs> you know, put oxygen on him. Oh. Rolled him out to the uh, stretcher. And then I helped them push Brian Garlic back into the um, – back room and helped him load him into the ambulance and i was also like man i i don't know that that's what i want to do to guys i don't i don't necessarily want to do that to guys i wanted to beat him but i didn't know i didn't know how to turn it off yet like once i was going i was going i was a street fighter and and i wanted to i wanted to hurt that guy and and i and i, and I did but then i started to know like i can fight and i can beat these guys that are trained and then what happened though is I was like, I, I was, I was loud about, I think I'm the best fighter in Utah. And if well, you, well, some, let me just interject. So everybody can kind of understand he's fighting weekly and he's got eight fights in four months. So the learning degree isn't very high within a short period of time. And you're, you're showing a lot of progress at a rate that most people can't even wrap their heads around. Right. And it really upset the local fighters. It, it really should have. Upset. It would have. Me too. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Right. It really upset him. And, and one person it really, really upset was Jeremy Horn. Because Jeremy Horn was at these fights listening to me be like, I'm the baddest dude in the state. You want some? Come get some. <laughs> and, and, and Jeremy Horn called Mike Stidham up. And said, if you don't, if you tell Berkman, tell Berkman he better stop saying he's the best fighter in the state, or I'm going to come show him who's the best fighter in the state. Did you know who he was at the time? I, I this is how I found out who Jeremy Horn was. I had oh. no idea who he was. <laughs> like I said, I was a football player and a baseball player, you know? Yeah. And so Mike Stidham called me up and goes, Hey, you're doing something right. Cause Jeremy Horn just called me and told me you better shut your mouth. And I said, tell Jeremy Horn that he wants some, come get some. <laughs> and he did not like that. So he had a guy. And, and then, so this is another story about Jeremy. Cause 
me and Jeremy had our history, you know, is Jeremy walked into a 7-Eleven and was telling my brother and his friend that he was an MMA fighter. And my brother was like, do you know Josh Berkman? And he's like, that kid's not a real fighter. You know, he's not a, he's not a real fighter. He shouldn't he's even- He's only got four months in. You really only got four months. So my brother. And then a lot of people, like I was a college football player. I played football and baseball. I was all state in the sports. I was, I was, I knew everybody, all, you know, all before. And so a lot of people kept being like, Jeremy, do you know Berkman? Do you know Berkman? <laughs> and he did not like that at all. And so what he did is he said, he had a guy named Jeremy Brown that trained with him. And they're like, oh, we're going to throw Jeremy Brown at him. And I beat Jeremy Brown in a guillotine in 11 seconds. Oh. And that was like one of Horn's guys. That was your seventh fight. That was my, okay. So that was my, and they were like, Horn, this kid's going to smash Berkman. He's finally going to shut Berkman up. They were all around the cage yelling at me, saying stuff. I choked him out in like 11 seconds with a guillotine. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I stood up and was like, you want some? Come get some. I'm the baddest dude in Utah. So, so he beats Horn's good student, obviously. Right. Brian Gerlich, was he in the hospital for three weeks? He was in the hospital for a period of time. I, I don't remember exactly what it was, but he was in the hospital yeah. for, for a while. I, I think he had a broken nose, a broken cheekbone. He was beat up. He was was that his last fight? Did you end his career? He never fought again. Yeah. <laughs> don't mess with my family you know that's it <laughs> you should just lost. even in the ring he should have lost yeah. in the ring <laughs> and whatever, you know? yeah that was, that was it for brian garlic so as, as it so should have you know you get those two fights which obviously are impressive but then dennis hallman sends uh derek downey at you future ufc veteran goes by right. the gentleman derek downey's no joke either he's one of hallman's top guys so right. in a very very short window of time the I guess the forefathers of modern day MMA were all pretty angry at you for sure. And this is another one where Horn and those guys they were all like, "Oh, Downey's gonna beat Berkman. This is the guy." And you know, it was it was a it was it was not a close fight, um, I, I, but it went to a decision. And but you know, I, I beat I beat him up. You know, pretty much the whole time. Important and, for your gas tank, though. Super yeah. important to test your gas tank. Right. And and I didn't really, nobody taught me to breathe yet. Nobody taught me how to pace myself yet. You know, and, and, and a lot of those fights before they were a minute, they were 30 seconds. They were three seconds. They were 11 seconds. So people were just like, what is this dude? Do a magic know? tricks, bro. That's what you're I, doing. And, and everybody else was going out and grappling and wrestling around. And I was getting <laughs> knockouts and pushing people out of the ring and you know, cause I was just really, really aggressive, you know? And, and I finally had a place that I could, I could channel that. And man, I just found out, I just, I just found out what I loved, you know, and, and it was MMA and it was wrestling and it was fighting and it was being in the gym grinding and nobody during those early days um, outwork, outworked me. You know, I was, I was in the gym, guys would leave and a new group would come in and I would still be training with, with all of them because I wanted to make it in the UFC and I wanted to make it in the UFC quick. <laughs> So Chris, this is how it goes. He gets Horn's guy. Then he gets Dennis Holman's guy. Rematch with Horn's guy. Wins the decision again. Matt Lindlin and Dan Henderson. Guys that shouldn't even be thinking of a guy on the independent circuit. Right. Get fed up and they send a Matt Horwich. <laughs> so, man, this is... You made everybody angry. Right. That's, <laughs> that's, that's partially true. Um, and... Yeah. Man, nobody, nobody told me who Horwich was, you know, but so I had won nine fights in a row in Utah and the, I, I was, I was training hard. Um, and I wish somebody could have gotten it to me earlier, but I was partying even harder than I was training and fighting. Right. Like, because I was on TV, I was making money. Um, and I was, I was popular at all these bars and fights that I would show up at. And so all of a sudden I had a level of fame that nobody could have um, prepared me for. Yeah. I was, I was partying, I was um, drinking. And there was, there was one week, one month, it was a month 
And what, so when did you say I fought Horwich? When was that? All right, so you fought Matt Horwich February 21st, 2004. Is the actual, the first sport fight. Okay, so the month before that, I was like, I've never been really beat up. I've been in all these fights. Like, what, there's something different. There's something different, and I want to figure it out. And so I just started drinking. And I just started doing a lot of cocaine Oof. and I just started to like party so hard just to see like if I could overcome it, what I could do with it. And there was a night that I did a massive amount of cocaine. Um, terrible for your heart. I mean, it was, you know, a little bit, probably terrible for everything, everything. Yeah. And, but it also gave me these crazy visions. Right. And, uh, <laughs> but what <laughs> happened is, I, I, I did a lot of cocaine in front of a few of my friends in my house. And I said, this isn't even going to touch me. Watch. And then 10 minutes later, I looked at everybody and I said, Hey guys, I'm going to go upstairs and I'm going to go to bed. And they're like, that's, that's not normal. Yeah. Yeah. Not normal. Not normal. And they were like, what? And it was a Saturday night, Sunday. I had slept and did not wake up. Um, Monday, my roommate wanted to open my door and check on me, and he didn't dare go into my room because he thought I was dead. And he's like, I just couldn't walk in your room. Um, and on Tuesday, my dad showed up at my house, knocking on my window. My brother was calling my dad. My, brother, my dad was calling my brother. And they were like, I can't get a hold of Josh. My dad pounded on my window. And I almost feel like I came back into my body. And I sat up and I had a crazy experience, uh, out of body experience showing me like my life, if I would live it more sober minded and more clear and more clean. And then my dad banged on my bedroom window. And when he banged on my bedroom window, I sat up and I, I said, hold up, dad, I'm coming. And I went to the door. And I opened the door and he gave me a really big hug. And he's like, man, I'm so glad you're okay. And they knew I was out partying and they knew what I was doing. I didn't hide that from anyone. You know, I was a very open book, you know? And uh, my dad goes, are you okay? Can I do anything? I said, you better just take me to the hospital. You need to take me to the hospital. I should go to the hospital. And I was like, what day is it? You know, and he's like, it's Tuesday. I'm like, and I've been asleep for three days. <laughs> three days, no water. Wow. Three days, no water laid in my bed. I mean, I feel like I was in a coma for three days. I mean, I didn't get up. I didn't go to the bathroom. I didn't do it, you know? And so my dad took me to his doctor. They did blood tests on me. I was like, doc, let me tell you about my blood real quick. <laughs> when we were on the way home from the, um, the doctor's office, um, the, uh, Matt, not Matt Lindman, Joe Marcello called me up. He was a promoter. He was like, you know, getting guys show fights and everywhere. And he goes, hey, Matt Lindman called me up and they want you to fight a guy named Match Hor Horwich in Oregon. And I was like, when? They're like three weeks. Listen, I had been on a bender for a month. Um, I was training a little bit, but if we were training, we were drunk. And um and I was just like, yeah, I'll take the fight. I'll take the fight. So I had three weeks to get ready for this fight. We got then, a goal too. It forces you to kind of focus. Right. right. Refocus right away. You know, yeah. also this, you know, this, this out of body experience, this vision I had, I, I knew I was supposed to take this fight. I knew it was going to lead me to where I needed to be. And, and again, I've won nine in a row. Like I'm going to, I'll be beat whoever, you know? I mean, I had a beer before I fought Jeremy or Derek Downey. You know, I was up in the back. <laughs> you know, I'm like, hey, Josh, you can't do that. I'm like, oh, cool, here. <laughs> um, so, let, and let me also like um, tell you, I don't drink now. I don't party now. I don't do any drugs now. I'm very sober minded, but it's all part of my journey and part of my path, you know? And, um, and I wouldn't be who I am now if I, I didn't go through all these crazy things, but I'm really okay talking about all of it, you know? And uh, so I took the fight. I went to Oregon. Matt Lindland goes, 
Okay, it's three three-minute rounds. We know you've never fought five-minute rounds before, so it's three three-minute rounds. We got it switched for you. And I was like, cool. So we go in. I'm fighting this Horwich guy. I'm like, this how, is how is the smell? He he smelled funny. He looked funny. He was wearing a <laughs> trench coat at weigh-ins. I was <laughs> like, I am going to destroy this human. We can get three <laughs> sentences together. <laughs> and... And he's, he come up to me, he's like, hey, how you doing? I'm Matt, I'm Matt, I'm fighting you. Nice to meet you, nice to meet you. Praise Jesus. And then walked away. And I was like, <laughs> what the hell was that? And, and Matt Horowitz, you know, he's a savant. All he wants to talk about is scriptures and martial arts. <laughs> and nobody told me that. They're like, he's good, be careful. <laughs> and so about three minutes and 30 seconds into the first round, um, Matt Wait. walks over. <laughs> Past the three minute mark? Yeah. Matt walks over. I, I have Horwich against the ropes. I'm looking at my coach, and Matt Lindland goes, Five minute rounds, Josh. Five ah. minute rounds. <laughs> <laughs> well Which, played. That's a veteran you know, move. Right Lindland, that wasn't an accident. Yeah, well, that was a veteran move. That's a well played on their part. <laughs> well played, right? So <laughs> he, uh, Horwich ends up beating me i think second right. round maybe third i'm exhausted i mean i wore a jack daniels shirt into the ring in my walkout you know and after the fight Lindlin goes man i am so sorry i had no idea that the commission turned that into two five minute rounds that's what it was two five minute rounds and i go oh are you sorry and he goes yeah anything i can do for you you let me know <laughs> I said, you know what I want to let you let me do? And he goes, name it. I'll put you on the next card. I'll do whatever you need me to do. I said, I want you to find me a place to live. And I want to come out here and I want you to let me train for free. And he's like, huh? And I said, yeah, I'll be back in a week. And he goes, okay, if you're back in a week, you got a deal. So I came home. I gave everything I owned away. I gave away all my clothes, my TV, my bed, my dresser. I told my buddy, you can, you can have it all. You can live in my room. And I lived with like four other guys, you know, I said, I'm moving to Oregon. And I packed up a training bag and I packed up a bag with some training clothes. I threw it in my car. I drove to Oregon. I think I was out there four days later. I lived in a hotel for the first couple of days. And then after I lived in the hotel, I moved into uh, Robert Follis's house for about a week. Legendary. Right awesome. after I lived with Follis, I moved in with Dennis Davis for a minute. Okay. And, and then I, my buddy ended up moving out there and we ended up living in an attic, Matt Lindland's attic uh, of a house <laughs> he owned in a place called Felony Flats uh, for the next almost maybe year and a half. Something like that. So, so I mean, what I, what was it about them that made you go, I, I'm going to train here? Do you know how good they were? I mean, what, what was it about them that made you go, I'm moving here? Man, when I showed up, I was just like, this is a room full of killers. Okay, you could tell. Chris okay. Lieben was there, um, and they were all kind of together and with each other. And, and, um, and then I kind of like, I knew Matt was an Olympic wrestler. Um, I knew Randy Couture was the world champion at the time, I believe. Yeah. And I wanted to be around a world champion. I wanted to see how he trained and how he got to where he got. And Evan Tanner. Evan Tanner was there, who was one of my best friends the whole time I was there. Even moved out to Utah and lived with me for a while. Okay. Um, you know, helping him try to deal with stuff that I got over that he could never get over, you know. And, um, but what really got me was I thought that they had this kid that's nearly handicapped kick my ass. I was like, if, if they could teach this dude, Matt Horwich, to beat me, I'm going to be uh, great out here. And that's really, you know, what was like that, that, that really made it. I was like, whatever you're doing, bro, I want to do what you're doing. And so um, I moved out there. My buddy that I lived with there ended up moving to Vegas, Robert Rovita. He was, uh, he was uh, I'm the one that got him tied to, we were good friends in junior high. So I got tied him tied to sport fight. And then he moved to Vegas and started managing fighters and stuff. Nice. And I stayed in the attic and I lived in the attic for a year with no TV, 
no radio. Um, all I did is study martial arts. I had a dummy in there. Um, I would go to practice in the morning with Randy when he was the world champion. Randy asked me to train with him. So I would go in the mornings and Randy and I would do plyo workouts and he would teach me about diet and nutrition. And I would pick his brain why I get, you know, trained with him. And, uh, and then in the afternoons we would go and train. And then at night we were doing the team quest instructional course with Robert Fallis. And I feel like that year and a half was like, uh, really what gave me that solid foundation in MMA, but I beat a couple guys. And after I beat the couple guys that I wasn't supposed to beat, um, there was a kid named, uh, Casey Oscola. And everybody thought he was the baddest dude around for a minute. So Chris Casey Oscola, future uh, team alpha male uh, coach. Yeah. yeah. And Chris Lieben didn't want to fight him. And I was like, I'll fight him. And, you know, I beat, I beat him. And then I got a phone call from Joe Marcello again. And Joe Wait, Marcello. So, so Joe Marcello, just so everybody knows, he's the promoter for Cage Fighting Championship. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And he was kind of like, you know, really in the game. Yeah, big time. Everybody knew all the fighters, knew everybody, you know. I think it was him and Rich Layton. They were yeah, Rich Layton, yep. yeah. And uh, they called me up, and I hadn't even um, been, I hadn't even, I, I had been to Utah a couple times. People were pissed at me, my training <laughs> partners for leaving, but really I just wanted to go be about the best guys in the world, right? So that I could, you know, be the best. I didn't want to be the best guy in Utah. I want to be one of the best fighters in the world. And I knew that if I was just training with the guys that I was better than, I would never get there. And um, when I, then they, uh, Joe Marcello called me up and he said, guess what? And I was like, what? He's like, Jeremy Horn's opponent fell out. And I told, <laughs> him, I, I told him, I know a guy that would fight him. And I was like, bro, you know, I'll take that fight. And uh, he's like, are you serious? He's like, do you want to talk to Matt Lindland or Robert Fallis first? And I was like, no, just I'll tell him. <laughs> and I went and told Robert Fallis, I'm like, listen, I'm taking a fight with Jeremy Horn in Seattle. And, uh, and this is like I said, after we went on a nice little win streak, you know, and, but, but, uh, did this start also, I know you were on the IFC with Brian Weber. Uh, yeah. Jennifer, Howe was the main event? Did you and Jeremy get into an argument there? Yeah, well, something happened with Jeremy um, about about Weber, but he always just he just didn't like me, and so he always told somebody something or said this about this. And so, what happened with Jeremy Horn is it wasn't it wasn't I don't think it was Brian Weber. I think it might have been the fight before Brian Weber, um, or maybe it was Brian Weber. Drew Ellisor. It was Drew Ellisor. Is that one on there? <laughs> Drew Ellisor, you guys, I think you refused to sign that contract. I think they were trying to. Okay, so I fought Drew Ellisor. Yeah. So, and Drew Ellisor was also a Jeremy Horn guy. May 1st, 2004. <laughs> yeah. So he was, and Jeremy Horn was the main event, um, or maybe in that fight. And so what happened is I was the co-main event. Jeremy Horn was the main event. And I said, I won't fight in this fight unless I'm the main event. Jeremy Horn can't be the main event. If you guys don't make me the main event, I'm not coming because nobody's coming to watch Jeremy Horn and everybody's coming to watch me. <laughs> so they gave me a little bit of money and I ended up taking the fight. And I fought and um, I beat one of their guys. Uh, the Drew Ellisor was one of their guys. Yeah. And I'm walking out of the ring and there's another guy that was one of Jeremy's like brown belt buddies. And he had a girlfriend and his girlfriend looks at me and goes, my husband is going to kick your ass. And it was this other guy. And I go, I looked at her and I go, your husband has got an ugly wife. <laughs> this is literally what I got out of the cage and Jeremy's fighting next. And I walk back in the back room. Jeremy fights, whatever. I go back to Oregon. There is a, and, and so all this, Jeremy doesn't like me even more. And now I take this fight with Jeremy Horn, right? After, and all this is building up. They're throwing their guys at me. I beat them all. 
You know, now me and Jeremy and taunting. Up. There's there's taunting after you beat them too. Oh yeah, I, I like I said, I was 25 years old. I was I ran my mouth, you know, and I was like, Jeremy, you want some? Let's go, you know. And I didn't help the situation, but I was trying to promote fights, you know. And I really truly believed I I was the best fighter in Utah, you know. I and and that belief probably got me further than I should have at that point, right? And so then. I'm going to fight Jeremy Horn. He's the number one ranked fighter in the world at the time. I have 14 fights, maybe. Jeremy's got a hundred and eight of them <laughs> in four months. You've got eight <laughs> fights in four months out of 14. I've been fighting a year and a half, two yeah, years. It's maybe, nothing. You know? Yeah. But yeah, like I get a chance to beat Jeremy Horn. I'm about to be the number one fighter in the world, is what I thought. Stay champ. Yeah, yeah. Here I go. That's what I've been waiting for. And uh, so I go out, Jeremy tells everybody in interviews, he's not going to submit me. He's going to put my blood all over the, the front row, um, that he doesn't like me, that I'm not a real martial artist, um, which I'm like, hey, I just got started. Give me a minute, you know? <laughs> and, and he was just really vocal about it. <laughs> which, and, which isn't like Jeremy, you know what I mean? No. <laughs> right? exactly no. I just, so for some reason, you, you know. You rubbed him the wrong way. Right from the beginning. Okay. Yeah, just from the beginning. Who's this Berkman kid that thinks he's tough, you know? And 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 I think if he would have, like, looked at me differently and maybe tried to bring me in, I probably could have found a gym to train at and been around him and Griffin and Alex and all those guys. Because me and Alex ended up being, what's Alex's last name? Steebling. Steebling. You guys remind me of each other way oh, back we- I, I was the first person who he trained with, man. We were buddies from the from the get go, man. He's still one of my good buddies. He's he's a he's a he's a crazy guy, but no, I like Alex. Yeah, we yeah. had him on here. Yeah. And yeah. Alex was like, man, I've never understood why Jeremy didn't like you. He just didn't like you because me and Alex ended up being buddies and training. No, was- <laughs> and um, so I fight Jeremy Horn. We go out and swing at each other, and he realizes, I think, pretty quick that like, oh, maybe this kid can fight a little bit. So I put him into the cage, I pick him up and I slam him and he's got a nasty guillotine around my neck. And I'm like, there is no way I'm tapping to this dude. I'm getting out. And the last thing I remember is waking up. And so Horn <laughs> tapped me out. Or he didn't tap me out, he put me to sleep and he yeah. stood up and he spit on me. Oh, he stood up and he spit on me. And I didn't know. I got up and I went over to shake his hand. And my brother's like, don't shake that dude's hand. He just spit on you. And my dad started yelling at Horn. My brother started yelling at Horn. And then we go back in the back and I'm like, he spit on me. I'm like, what? you know, whatever. I was just pissed that I lost, <laughs> you know. And uh, and then we, then all of a sudden, I, I a couple weeks later, this article comes out and it's uh Jeremy Horn spit on Josh Berkman because he called his wife a bitch, you know, and if you know me and you knew me at that time, I wasn't disrespectful in that way. You know what I mean? Like I was, uh, I I was polite to women. I was, uh, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't like that. You know, I would talk shit to the dude I'm fighting. Maybe loose at the tongue, but yeah, yeah, it's different. You know, and, but I would, I definitely wouldn't have called his wife a bitch or been rude or whatever, you know, but I think he just covered that because he was so upset for all those years or that whole year. Um, and he, and he, and he beat me, but he submitted me and I think he wanted to beat me up and yeah. he didn't, you know? And so he got up and he spit on me and then he had to kind of like say, well, this is the deal. Justify and it. He had to justify it. He had to justify it. And so I felt like that was such like a hard moment on me because I just had a shot, shot at the number one guy in the world. I really believed that I was going to beat him. And, and a couple, a month or two before that, the Ultimate Fighter 1 series came out. And I had made the show. I had made the Ultimate Fighter 1. Really? Uh, yep. And the cr- producer, Craig Polizian, would call me a couple of times. Like, we would chat about the show. He, um, but I was on the show at 2.05. So I was going to be fighting Forrest Griffin, Stefan Bonner, wow. all those guys. And Lieben was it, but they're like, we have one spot and that's, we want you to fight at 205. And I'm like, I'll fight at 205. It don't matter. And uh, that's crazy. Crazy, right? <laughs> yeah. and, and they told us that um, the, that there was no, that there was no testing or anything like that. 
and I had been, I had a buddy that got drafted in the NBA. His name was Jackson Broman. And so for a, a big period before the ultimate fighter, I was there with, um, out there with him and we were partying again. We were screwing around again. And then I get a phone call. They're like, Hey, we're going to test you guys. We're going to do you guys, do steroids test on you guys. And I was like, okay, cool. And we showed up at the tests. This is a week before the ultimate fighter one started. And um, I told the guy, I said, listen, I am going to, I'm going to, I'm going to fail this test miserably for everything. <laughs> It's gonna light up like a Christmas tree. <laughs> so I, I, listen, I took a little a little wind straw because I didn't know we were getting tested, and my buddy, right. I, I was smoking weed. I did some cocaine last week. None of this was my fault. Yeah, you guys told me you weren't testing, so I just want you guys to know I'm an honest guy, and I probably won't pass these tests. They they've been tested, and they say thank you, sir. Just leave, or they test you. They tested me. They te I, I got the test. You got to use the middle of your urine stream. A week before. I mean, it was, like I said, I, we, we were wild at that point too, you know, like, and there was a, there was a good year where I was really clean, really sober. And, and then my buddy got drafted. We started hanging out in Scottsdale and well. Yeah. This was not that period. Right. Yeah. Was, going away. We were enjoying, this was our enjoying period. Right. <laughs> and uh, I mean, it was, we worked our lives off to be pro athletes. He just got the big contract. I was still broke and well, let's go party. So <laughs> um, what So what ended up happening is I, I went home, told me to still pack all my stuff and just get ready to come out. And then they're sure things will be fine. So I packed my bags. I got ready to, uh, to go to the airport. I was on my way to the airport and I got a phone call from a 702 number. And they said, Josh, Pat, you failed your test. And I was like, well, I'm not surprised. And uh, <laughs> they said, so you're not going to be able to be on the Ultimate Fighter. And we're going to find a replacement for you. Um, and Craig called me and he said, hey, what are you doing with your life? And I was like, man, I'm just enjoying it. You know, and he's like, you have, you just screwed the biggest opportunity of your life. He's like, you know, um, and you know, no, is this the guy that was giving you money, Craig? No, Craig was the UFC, the producer of the Ultimate okay. Fighter. Okay, okay. And uh, he said, get your life together. Stop partying. Stop screwing around. If this show's good, goes good, we're going to do another one. And um, and I'll be getting a hold of you. And I was like, cool. So that, um, that was embarrassing because I was coaching high school football. Um, Did it come out publicly? Yeah, you know, it, 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 well, not, not, it didn't come out publicly. I told them, I, <laughs> I told them, I was like, listen, you guys, I, I know I'm supposed to be gone right now, but I'm back. I made some decisions that, you know, um, cost me one of the bigger opportunities in my life. I was like, I will fix it, you know, but like, and I, I just kind of like let them right. learn the lesson right along with me, you know? Man. You're, you're a little more honest than me. I think I'd have been like, there's this shoulder injury that's kind of holding me back. Right, and I'm yeah. gonna, I'll, I'll, I'll do the next one. I'll do the next one, right? And so then I went back. Well, who do you think took your spot? Yeah, who did take it? I had no idea. Because I, I don't know who wasn't on or was it, you know? I didn't, I didn't know who it was. And I didn't watch it because I was pissed off. And I couldn't watch Lieben and I couldn't, you know, I didn't, I didn't even watch it. Now, was were you buddies point? sleeping at the time? Were you guys buddies? I mean, you trained yeah, together. We're really good friends. We trained, you know, getting him ready. Um, me and Lab Lieben were great friends um, from my time in Portland. Me, Chris oh, Lieben, man. Dennis Davis, Ed Herman. Um, we even let Horowitz hang out with us here and there. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that was that young group because none of us had made it yet, you know? Yeah, yeah. Every one of us all stars. Up, every one of us ended up making it. All know? stars. It's an yeah, all-star team. Pretty, pretty awesome time, you know, where we were all just coming up and, and we all ended up having pretty decent careers. Let's talk about Casey Escola real quick. A lot of people wanted no part of him whatsoever. And right. you finished him. Yeah. You know, I, 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 everybody was telling me, we even went and watched him fight at a little arena, you know. And again, he was the guy to beat. It wasn't Chris Levin. It wasn't Ed Herman. Casey Oscola, Casey Oscola. Was, yeah. was his nickname. 
And I think, I think everybody was a little shocked when I beat him, you know, but, but again, I wasn't as soon as they offered the fight when Lynn's like, you know, Hey, Lieben didn't want this fight. You want it? I'm like, yeah, I want it. And, and I, I handled him pretty easy, you know, and that's why I had the belief in myself because I started, I beat Chilo Gonzalez. He was really good. Casey Uscola was, you know, um, that guy. And I, but you're finishing these guys. That's the crazy part. Like you're making it look easy. This is when I was, you know, training three times a day, living in an attic, reading martial arts, studying scriptures, you know, like I was, I don't, I feel like at that point, I, nobody was going to beat me, you know, but again, I didn't learn my lessons and I did the whole thing, you know, um, and that was kind of like my cycle, you know, and, but so those were big wins, which led me to the Jeremy Horn fight. The Jeremy Horn fight came after the disappointment of the ultimate fighter one. And I was just like, I don't know what I'm going to do now. You know, like my shot at the UFC might, you know, be out. I just lost to Jeremy Horn. Um, I have a long road back, you know, and um, it couldn't have been a week or two later. Craig Polizian called me up and was like, hey, we're doing this again. He's like, did you get your life together? And I was like, yeah, life together. He goes, can you make 170 pounds? I said, I don't know. I've never made it before, but I think I can. He said, what, okay. what did you wrestle at in high school? Re high school, I wrestled 171. Okay. And I played football at 189 pounds in high school. So, so you're going back to high school weight. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I hadn't been under 180 pounds since high school, you know, <laughs> wrestling in high school. And uh, that was – go ahead. No, I was gonna say not only that, but I mean, you got to be able to make that on like two days' notice. You know what I mean? So the the Ultimate Fighter House is a crazy place to be making that for the first time. I, I that's 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 a tough. I didn't know that was your first time making that. Yeah, it, if you look at my record, all I had never even fought under I think one hundred and eight ninety or one hundred and eighty five pounds before the Ultimate Fighter. Me wow. and Kisola, I think fought at like one eighty five. Me and Jeremy Horn fought at one ninety five. Um, I had never even thought about fighting at welterweight, except for Robert Fall has said, if you want to be great, you got to be a welterweight, you know? And now I'm like, I don't know. I think I could have beat up most of the 85 pounders and not and been able to eat a hamburger. I'm, I'm in agreement with you. I think the lighter you go, the, the tougher guys are. I mean, he, I think heavyweights are terrible fighters. They're big and strong, you know, and, and every weight class you go down, they get a little bit better. More, t I mean, like those 135 pounders are good at everything. You know what I mean? Bigger guys are, I mean, you probably way. would have dominated 185. Yeah, I feel the same way. I feel like I would have been able to move better. You know, I think, yeah. as you said, you know, I think the, the power level's higher at the higher weight classes. But if you go down, the power level goes, but the skill level definitely, I think, goes up, you know? Yeah, agreed. So You'll that's put kind of how I, uh, how, and then I went down, did all the tests, passed all my tests. And the next thing I knew, man, I went from losing to Jeremy Horn to being on the Ultimate Fighter. And Jeremy Horn's karma caught him too because he had to fight Chuck Liddell in the main event of the UFC, his next fight. And he got beat up pretty good. And I was like, eh, take that, bro. <laughs> so I'm not going to call it controversial, but I, I feel almost as if the Ultimate Fighter was almost like a setup for you kind of coming in. So you get picked up. You guys got to pick your teams. Matt Hughes picks you. Right. Now that Matt Hughes pick you, you also kind of publicly were talking trash about Matt Hughes. Right. <laughs> so he picks you, and then you fight the toughest guy in the house, arguably, in a season filled with a lot of talent, right. and Melvin Gillard. Was that Matt Hughes sending you off, trying to give you the hardest fight right away? Well, so as soon as we got on the Ultimate Fighter, <laughs> Matt knew who I was. Of course. I'm a great fighter, necessarily. Because his buddy's Jeremy Horn. Right? That's right. So after two days of training, Matt Hughes comes up to me and goes, hey, can we talk? And I don't, he hadn't picked teams yet, you know? And he goes, you know, Jeremy Horn told me you had no skill and that you were a shitty person. And he goes, and I've been watching you and I think you're probably the most skilled kid in this house. And I actually think you're a really good person. And and then he's like, we're doing Bible study at the house tonight. You should go. <laughs> you know? And then I think um, 
and that was it. Matt Hughes picked me. Me and Matt were great. You know, we've always been friends ever since then. Um, he's like, I'm okay. gonna do Jeremy told me, and I'm going to judge you on who you are in this house. I figured it was just kind of, I got this, Jeremy. I'm going to put him on my team. I'm going to make him fight Melvin Gillard. Okay. I, I figured it was kind yeah, of. And that was like actually, that. Melvin was my choice. Um, okay. Because I had trained with everybody, and there was nobody in the house that was going to beat me. Joe Stevenson wasn't going to beat me. Melvin wasn't going to beat me. I handled these dudes in practice. Um, How much weight I was, were you I was at? Be a bit fighter winner. Where and were I, you at weight wise? I was Going right around one eighty five. So I went into the house at eighty five, and then I started eating really good and seeing what Luke Kumo was eating and being like, "Hey, bro, have piss? Some, of your, some of your stew." <laughs> 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 and uh, so. What happened was we had a um, we had a we had to compete for on the Ultimate Fighter one. You got to compete. You had a competition, and whoever won that competition, oh yeah, that team got to pick the fight. So we had a, a competition, and you had to pick up a bag and take it into the end zone. Right? I grabbed the bag, got into the end zone, and we won the first competition. And then we all sat around. And what they didn't show on the TV show was Matt was like, who wants to fight? And I was like, I do, you know? And he's like, well, you want us to competition. Who do you want to fight? And I said, I want to fight Melvin. And he's like, well, let's talk about this. If we fight Melvin, we get out their strongest competitor. But if we fight George Gurgel, he's injured and you get an easier fight. And I was like, listen, I'm going to fight Melvin and I'm going to beat Melvin. And then we're going to win again. And I'm going to pick George and I'm going to beat George. And I'm going to beat every person in this house. <laughs> and that's because you got an extra 5,000. And Matt's like, well, we're going to let everybody fight, but we'll let you fight Melvin first. And that's kind of how that came up. Hold on. You mean you could have fought more than one time? I don't remember how this set. It was a different setup, but you could have fought somebody else again. Yeah. Cause they, they didn't, well, you didn't, it was who <laughs> the coach wanted to fight. And you could pick the matchups, and whatever team won the competition, that coach got to pick the matchup. Berkman versus everybody. And that's, that's how I was. felt. I was like, listen, man, they can be everybody in this house, bro. And, oh, that's funny. And so, but, um, so, and Melvin was running his mouth nonstop in that house, which was no surprise to anyone. Did he have his Snoopy slippers on and sunglasses? Because that's the Melvin I remember right around that time. Probably, because he always had his sunglasses on. Yeah. Jack's too sure what slippers he was wearing. Um, but he was still Melvin, and he was loud. And he was like, I'm going to whoop everybody's ass. And I was like, your mouth, you know, just cast you a, a, a check you, you can't sign, right? Or whatever that thing is. And I was like, and you're going to fight me. And me and you are going to fight, and I'm going to get you out of this house right away because I'm sick of listening to you. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the plan. And so when everybody saw that I picked Melvin, I thought, I, you know, I, I, I feel like I handled Melvin pretty easily considering, um, except for he threw a big kick and broke my arm and snapped it in half. Um, it wasn't a small break. It was a, a complete fracture of the uh, break of the bone. And I did it in the second round. So the beginning of the second round. So I fought the rest of the second round, fought the third round. And I knew my arm was hurt, but when they went to raise my arm, I was like, oh, man. And then I told them, hey, we need to get my arm checked. And uh, we went to the doctor. They x-rayed my arm. It was broken in half. Um, Dana's like, you know, obviously can't be on the show. I'm like, I could fight with a broken arm. And he's like, we can't let you fight with a broken arm. He's like, um, and so I got put in the sequester house, and I was off the show. You weren't on the show or anything anymore. And it was just me and Melvin in the sequester house, I think, at first. He had a cast. How uncomfortable was that? He broke his hand. We actually ended up being super cool. We ended up being good buddies. One day, Dana White calls up the chaperones and goes, tell Berkman to get ready. I'm coming to get him. It was like the first day, and Melvin's like, why are you going to go with Dana? I'm like, I don't know what he wants. So Dana picks me up. We go to dinner at a steakhouse. He says... Um, you have a future in the UFC and you're not done. He's like, keep it together, stay in shape. I'll give you a fight on the finale. And if you win the fight on the finale, I'll give you a nine fight UFC contract. <laughs> I was like, awesome. Okay, cool. And then he took me gambling and 
we ended where up he he gambled more than you would have gotten in all nine fights added together. <laughs> <laughs> right. Hey, well, that's that's because if you, it sounds great, a nine fight contract that locks you into a shitty contract for. I mean, it's like that's not your benefit. Right. You want a three fight contract so you can renegotiate. Yes. A nine fight contract is not beneficial to you. If I could redo it all and we knew all <laughs> that, I would done it so much different. But the good <laughs> thing is, is I always managed myself in my career, and. Dana, I always had Dana's phone number and still do to this day, right? Like Dana came, took me to dinner. We went to cards. I won like 400, 500 bucks. Dana won some money too. He handed me the money. He said, here, keep it. Cause I went to give him the chips back. Cause it was his money. You know, he gave me my ID back too. So he gave me my ID and now we're in a sequester house where we're not supposed to have our ID. And now I got 500 bucks. <laughs> which we're not supposed to have money. We're not supposed to be able to go anywhere. So um, the next weekend came and I said, Melvin, I got 500 bucks. Um, let's go to the Green, Green Valley Ranch. And he's like, huh? And I'm like, yeah, we went gambling. Dana gave me the money. So me and, Dan, me and Melvin went over to Green Valley, Valley Ranch. Well, we happened to run into Matt Hughes, uh, Tim Sylvia, Dana White, they were all eating there. Dana's like, what are you guys doing out of the sequester house? I'm like, oh, we came over to gamble. You're the one that gave me my ID back. <laughs> and so we went and played craps. And Melvin won $2,500. Stop it. I gave him 50 bucks. He won 2,500 bucks. And he gave me half of it after. He gave me my money back and he gave me half of it. And that's, that's a righteous dude. That's how the, the, the relationship with me and Melvin went. And then I just, this is kind of like a cool story of like the ultimate fighter and everything. Then I came home after the ultimate fighter and hurricane Katrina hit in um, new Orleans. And I knew that it had hit right where Melvin lived. So I started to reach out to Dana and a few other people trying to be like, Hey, we got a fight in five weeks and what's going on with Melvin. And so uh, Melvin finally found out I was trying to get a hold of him, told him he could come out here and stay with me and train with me. And Melvin came to Utah uh, and trained with me to get ready for our first fight uh, on the Ultimate Fighter finale. That's and, cool, man. That's yeah, awesome. That was kind of like as much beef as we had. You know what I mean? He, he ended up coming out here, being a part of my family, being a part of my training camps. And we were friends for a lot of years to come. That's man, amazing. he's always he's always been great uh, around cool, me. Man. Like we always fought on the same cards, always hung out. And then uh, my first bare knuckle fight, he was there, and he can't. I mean, he's always been super cool to me, man. Melvin's a good guy. Yeah, Melvin yeah. was always a good guy. I haven't seen much of him lately. You know, I don't know what he's up to, but hopefully, he's still not trying to fight. And... <laughs> did, did, did you see the uh, Phil Baroni Evan Tanner kind of battles at Team Quest? No, because Phil, I think Phil was was not around as much when I was there. Okay. Um, but me and Evan became really good friends while I was out there. Um, and, but I never much, never, never saw much of that. But me and Phil Baroni never got along. And me and Phil Baroni had a couple altercations. Um, and, and I don't know where that came from either. Like there's just some there's just some people that don't like me sometimes. And so and that goes back into like kind of the career because after I um left Oregon to go to the Ultimate Fighter, I never went back to Oregon because Team Quest kind of like started to have their things and split up and Randy went out to Vegas and he was so things were kind of splitting up and everybody was starting to do their own thing out there. And so I stayed in Utah to train for um quite a while and i was training on my own again right just having my buddies come i built a gym in my garage having my brother and i had dennis davis who's the head coach at extreme couture he had moved from oregon to utah to, to train with me and to you know was, live next door to me and um then evan tanner came out to utah casey uscola came out to utah so we had a good group of fighters that showed up out here um and then Evan and Dennis went to Vegas um, uh, to do extreme couture with Randy. Randy. And I decided somebody called me up and said, Tito Ortiz is looking for some 
um, partners to go up to Big Bear with him. Um, and you're on the Ortiz Shamrock card with him. Um, do you want to go? And I was like, yeah. So Tito called me up, said, hey, you want to come train with us? It was right when they got done with the Ultimate Fighter with Kendall Grove and all those guys. And I was like, yeah. He's like, okay, cool. Give me your name, address, and name and information. I'll get you a flight. I'll fly you out here. We'll go up to Big Bear on this date. And I was like, cool. And I always wanted to train with Tito. You know, he was a world champion. I kind of liked, you know, the way that he like went and secluded himself in the, in Big Bear and stuff and lived as a group. And I wanted to be a part of that. And so I did that for the next couple of years. I would, I would go out and, um, and I was on, I got to fight on like, you know, the cards with Tito and Shamrock and a couple of those older ones. And those were pretty cool experiences. Um, for me, I think it wasn't the 24 seven show, but they had like an inside UFC, whatever. Um, and, and the, they, they would come up to big bear and film us. And, um, that was, a, that was a pretty cool experience too. But Phil Baroni, we had to drive back down to Huntington beach one day. And we went down to Huntington beach to the gym to do, uh, a, a, a basically like a punishment meet and greet. And Phil Baroni kept staring me down. And I was like, what is this? I think, I think some dudes, Phil Baroni wasn't in the UFC at the time. And I think some dudes were envious or pissed off. Right. And I said that about Jeremy Horn too. Um, you know, I was like, bro, you're going to be pissed, but you're going to be watching me for years to come. And you're going to go downhill because, you know, like I knew what I was doing. I knew I was focused. I believed in myself. I knew where I was headed. And, and, and so that's, it was easy for me to forget, you know, that like those things had happened because I, I also had tunnel vision and, and really believed that I was going to be a focused. UFC world champion. Yeah. You know? yeah. Um, the problem is, is in my twenties, I like to party as much as I like to win. And it was almost like I was fighting and winning so that I could go party for longer. Right. And that was one thing of, is we would, we would, I would stay really focused for like maybe eight to six to eight weeks and train for a fight. But then after the fight, I would go and I would go to LA and live at the Roosevelt and I would go to Scottsdale and hang out in Scottsdale. And I, I mean, I stayed in, I stayed at the hard rock for four weeks in a suite one time after I fought uh, John Fitch. <laughs> You know, I just, li I decided to live there and I made buddies with the host. The host was like, cool, stay in this room as long as you want. A month later, I was like, I got to go home. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And, and I, I think that was kind of like that, that early phase of the UFC and the ultimate fighters. And, 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 you know, Chris, I mean, it was Vegas loved these fighters. There was only a hundred of us at the time too, you know? And, yeah. and I just so happened to like, make sure that I knew the guys that owned Trist and make sure that we were buddies and, and, and in these right scenes. And it was really easy if you had a personality and you were in the UFC and you wanted to be in these fun party scenes. And it was something that was equally enjoyable to me as the training and the fighting itself. And I think that was my twenties. And I think that's, that was the difference of the young fighter and the older fighter is that I was a fighter. I would get ready for fights and then I would go party. And, um, but in my thirties, that switched. And I think I became more of a martial artist. And I think I'm even more of a martial artist now in my forties than I ever was during my career in the UFC, you know, getting older and smarter, but you know, it's funny. I was talking about, you talked about that about a hundred people in the contract, you know, back then they put on, you know, a fight every month or maybe every other month. And there wasn't hardly people. They, they knew all the fighters, you know, people knew all the fighters. So the few fighters that were like you talked about, we were known. And like you said, you go to Vegas, people knew who you were. Like now there's so many fighters, unless you're top, top tier. I don't know yeah. half the fighters. I'll look at a card. I'm like, I know three people who, that? who are all these other people. So it's, I don't know if oversaturation is the right word, but I feel like we were more in like the golden era where everybody knew every, all the real, it was, it was cool, man. I, I think so. Oh, cool. You knew we everybody. You know what I mean? Other, everybody, you know, like, yeah, it, it was, you know, everybody kind of knew those guys. And I think probably one of the differences for you and me is I was a 25 year old kid that got in the UFC in um, a matter of a couple years and I had big sponsors. So fighting wasn't the only way I was making money. I was making twice as much money 
with sponsors than I was for the fight. You know, I'd yes. make 40 grand for a fight, but I was making 105,000 in sponsorships, you know, nice. and, and, and I was good, but that's why I liked to party too, because I was taking my sponsors out. It was, it was a whole business that I was running, you know? And I think the big difference is, like I said, I was a 25 year old single kid, you know, you had, you had a career, you had your a, a wife, you had your kids, you know, and I didn't have any of those things that grounded me, you know? So I just got to fully live it. <laughs> oh, oh, trust me, man. I, I, I'm a wild person. Like whatever, like afterwards I, I go too hard, but like I'm restricted. I couldn't stay out in Vegas for a month. I can do it for two day or day and a half. And then I go go back to work. You know what I mean? So <laughs> yeah, that being grounded right. thing, uh, I, I just didn't have the opportunity to, to be an idiot, you know, I mean? like as much as I would have. Right. If I were in your situation, I'd have been a problem. So, yeah. You, you were also good friends with Stefan Bonner. Am I correct? Well, yeah, we were, especially early on after the Ultimate Fighter and things like that, you know, like they would all come to me for all these tricks because we had like the drink from uh, Pedro Sour, which is this cacao drink or acai, whatever, you know, and they'd be like, how do you have so much energy cutting all this weight? And so, you know, like me and Chris were saying, like we all knew each other and we would kind of like pile around and, and run around together. And I think like in the early twenties, um, Stefan and I were around each other quite a bit. And, you know, he was, he was a good dude, man. It's such a, sad thing to see all these fighters you know starting to pass away and you know um it's yeah, baroni situation is just as ugly yeah baroni situation man I, I, that's that's real ugly you know and that's why i was so that story with the ultimate or with with baroni is um then we ended up at the club um later on in in um la after the the event and um phil baroni like kept standing by me and kind of like bumping me out of nowhere. And I'd be like, and so I would just move and go to the other side. I'm not in the club to fight. I want to hang out, meet some girls and have some drinks. Whatever. And his girlfriend was there. Phil Baroni's girlfriend was there. So then I guess we were all just standing overlooking a dance floor. Right. And his girlfriend, I guess was standing next to me and he came and pushed her out of the way and goes, <laughs> don't talk to my girlfriend. And I said, listen, bro, you've been mad dogging me all day. I am not interested in your girlfriend. And don't touch me again. Because if you touch me again, I'm going to kick your ass in front of everybody. And he was like, oh, you think you're And Tito came in and broke it up, right? And, and, and stopped it. And then Phil Baroni sneaks back around Tito and my brother and blindsides me from the back. <laughs> And so I covered my head up and my brother was standing right next to me. And my brother lands like four shots right at Baroni's face. And Baroni falls on the ground. My brother jumps on top of Baroni, hits him once. Tito grabs my brother. My brother tries to shake it off. Tito puts my brother in a guillotine. I tell, I tell Baroni, I'm like, I tell Tito, I'm like, get off my brother. That's my brother. He's like, bro, we can't be doing this. He lets my brother go. I pick my brother up. My brother's half out of it. He's like, no, there's somebody, something on my ankle. There's something on my ankle. Baroni's on the ground trying to heel hook my brother. <laughs> this is in the middle of a club in the middle of a table. So I kick Baroni in the face, grab my <laughs> brother's leg, hit Baroni two more times. He covers up. They're not clean shots. Tito stops it. They grab Baroni. They grab me and my brother. Me and my brother take off. We go outside. Smart move. They got us all out of the club. Me, my brother, Baroni, and his girlfriend. And now we're all standing right outside the front door. And I'm like, come on, bro. You want to finish this? Let's finish this. And his girlfriend kind of like dragged him away. And we didn't chase after him or anything. And um, that was the Phil Baroni Josh Bird would fight in the club with Tito there and everybody. And it was, and then for years after, I was like, listen, if Phil Baroni was ever around, I was like, tell Baroni I got no issues with him. Like, I just tell him to stay away from me. And, but he was always that kind of like hothead, don't look at my girlfriend, mean to his chick. And what a crazy situation that is that he's got himself in Mexico. So you're not, you're not surprised by the Mexico situation. <laughs> 
No, I'm not surprised by that. When, when it happened, my brother sent me the, the link and was like, what about this? And I was like, that was just a matter of time. I oh, mean, dude. It's really yeah. unfortunate thing, but I'm surprised that Phil Baroni has lasted this long without finding himself in serious trouble. It's incredible he's made it this long. And what he's gotten away with, Hey, man, sometimes that shit comes and catches up to you. And you know what the sad part is? He's actually got people pretending that he's actually innocent. Right. Like, actually pretending, making videos that he's innocent. And it's just like, you know what, man? Don't ask me for shit. Like, I, I, I lived in that area for, like, a brief period of time in my life. I know all the attorneys there. I know some of the political people. I connected them, and then it's just like, well, we're gonna try to get Phil out of this. I'm like, man, I'm fucking. Don't don't call me anymore. Yeah, don't don't call me anymore. <laughs> yeah, you know, the the one thing, you know, that Jeremy Horn said about me was that I was I was I was I was just a brawler. I wasn't a real martial artist. Um, and I think that the one thing that I, I believe that I am now is not just a fighter. That, that martial arts and MMA has really encompassed my life in a, in, a, in, a, in a complete way, you know? And even, you know, our gym's called the dojo, but but what martial arts did for me is I had a similar, I don't know, want to say similar to Baroni, but similar to all us fighters, that we just were a little reckless. We, we really like competition. We want to prove that we're, we're very competitive. We want to prove that we're the baddest dude in the room or else we wouldn't go in that octagon and compete the way that we do. You know, we want to prove we're the best. And, you know, for me, I think that, you know, what I teach now is I, I, I don't just teach the fighters, but we teach that traditional way of, of martial arts, the respect, the integrity, you know, the honor, the compassion. And we have a system that teaches that, you know, and, as we reminisce on these, you know, the old fight career and who I used to be, I don't, I don't get to do that very often, but you know, what martial arts, you know, did for me in my twenties is it, it gave me these moments in my life where I was able to spend nine weeks really dialing in my nutrition and my health and my mind. And oftentimes that um, created this spirit about me that was um, came out and, and, and was reflected in the cage. And when I didn't live my life in that way, then that was also reflected in that way. And it was really clear to me that my performances were just an example of the way that I was living my life. Um, because when I was focused, nobody beat me. And when I was screwing around, I would lose. And my career went up and down like that, you know? And, and I just think it's, you know, uh, we, we, we say it's the ultimate fighting. We say it's, um, you know, uh, cage fighting, but really it's, it's, it's a rebirth of martial arts and, and hopefully what it's doing for other people is what it did for me. And it really saved my life and it gave me purpose. And now I'm able to like be able to help so many other kids start to be, deal with their egos and their emotion and their sadness and their bullying, you know, and it's like, it's so crazy that the people's warrior was a nickname that was given to me by uh, Robert Rovita. And I was like, I don't want a nickname. You know, I, all I want to do is Berkman. And I was all about me and enjoying my life and having fun. But it's, it's that journey of martial arts through my twenties that has really um, turned me, you know, into, into, into a real martial artist that cares about people, that cares about kids, that cares about this next generation that's training with me. And, you know, the Phil Baroni thing is like, man, be careful of your, 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 your actions and, and, and the way that you're doing things, because everything, you know, actions have consequences and it all comes back to you somewhere. You know, you know, it's, what's funny is I always think about the benefits you get from something like what we're doing, you know, mixed martial arts are in, in it's the discipline, the hard work, the dedication, the whole life encompassing thing. And I think of someone maybe like Phil, or maybe, I don't know, just somebody who's naturally athletic and gifted and might not have to work as hard and they get it without doing that. You don't get the benefits from it. So you, somebody might still be out of control. Like I said, I, I, I know what you're saying. Like to me, I, when I help train people, I want them to be good fighters, but more importantly, I want them to be good people. I want them to learn how to like be successful adults and work hard and all that stuff's more important to me than you being the best fighter. I mean, I want you to be great, but that's, that's second tier to me. I want you to be a good person. And, and I think a lot of people who just, I think in all sports, if you're just naturally athletic, you don't get the whole benefit from sports. But I think this one, 
even more so. You, it's hard to get through a whole thing without being extremely uh, just dedicated to everything and, and study the sport, know every aspect of it. And it has to really encompass your whole life, in my opinion. Absolutely. No, I think that's that's perfectly said. It encompass your own life and, and the discipline is what leads you to your greatest victories, you know, and the opposite of that also is your downfall, you know, and <laughs> it's, you know, and, and I had that hard lesson 29 years old, right? Like I had, I had, I had tasted the top 10, I had, I, had, I had big victories and big losses. And then, you know, my, my, I picked up a kid that I was fighting in the UFC and I slammed him. And when I slammed him, I herniated a couple of discs in my neck. Mm. Now, all of a sudden, at 29 years old, I had to go get an MRI. They're like, oh. you have a herniated disc. <clears throat> Your career's over. Um, and you need neck surgery. And um, I, so I told Joe Silva, I said, listen, um, I know I got a fight left, but I need to take time off. And he's like, okay, you know, think about it. And then he called me a week later and he's like, well, what about one more fight? And he's like, <laughs> um, Pete Sell? And I was like, oh, I can beat it. I can beat Pete Sell without training. <laughs> I couldn't train. All I was doing to get ready for this fight was hitting mitts. Oh. Um, but what it did is it made me look at my life and be like, man, I'm 29. I'm, I'm, I'm a herniated disc. I thought I had 10 more years in this career. And now it's over. And I didn't want that to be the reality of the situation. So I started look, I, I went to a couple surgeons. They both said I needed surgery. And then I talked to a lady named Dr. Basharan, who was the head of the um, Nevada Institute of Sports Science in Las Vegas. And um, man, the whole situation, I mean, I, I, stopped, I stopped drinking, I stopped partying. Um, I, I really was able to like put all these lessons together and I moved back home to Utah and I, um, through, through yoga, through a raw food diet, through um, just a more healthy lifestyle, I was actually able to heal my neck. Wow. Um, I went back in for an MRI and the lady, the Dr. Basharan and the other one, they did a case study on, um, on the whole thing that I did, went back in and I didn't have a herniated disc in my neck. We were able to popped it back in. Wow. Able to rehydrate the discs and realign the spine through like muscle and eye treatments. So I would like balance and do these eye tests with a guy named remember his name. And I was able to to heal myself and to heal my neck. But I was also able to be 30 years, 31 years old again. And they were like, if you want to fight, you can fight again. And I was like, (laughs) man. Okay, you know, and then I called up Dana and I called up Joe and they're like, sorry, we just bought Strike Force and we have all these other fighters coming in and you're gonna have to go fight somewhere else and prove to us that you can still fight because yeah, such a such a dirty business. Such a dirty business. Right? Chris, we're about at that two hour mark, buddy. Oh, are we really? Yeah, about an hour and forty five. We've I thought that we were only about an hour, but Josh, man, it's been fantastically fun. This has been awesome. Um, anytime you want to come back and finish it, let me know. But man, this has been hey. fun. I really appreciate it. you. Got a really interesting career, very interesting story. I still got um, more. So, man, it, it was just fun going to hearing all your cool stories, man. Thank you for being yeah, part of this for yeah, sure. Thanks for the conversation. Sometimes, like I said, I don't get to reminisce all this stuff, you know. And what's crazy is it's like, man, that's that's the 20s, you know. And and, and then again, I got to do it all again. I got to come back and fight in the, the younger. Uh, or in the circuit again and I won the fights possible to get back into the UFC to get back into the top yeah. 10 you know and it's just man martial arts has just been the, the, the greatest journey and uh, I appreciate you guys letting me come on hey, and hey Cash I'd like to do a part two with you with the rest of your career we'll, we'll give it like a month or something like this I know we're taking a time away from your family last couple hours so yeah dude it is it's absolutely just as fantastic is listening to you fighting hank weiss and getting that yeah. that loss back so excellent hey, thanks so way, much brother check out the full interview on itunes spotify and all major podcast platforms